All right, this is for background education only, and it's not legal advice. The reason is uh, a whole bunch of things, but primarily uh, legal stuff is very fact specific. So I don't want you to take anything on any of these slides and say, but Joe said this. What you should think about this is these are some red flag things, some things you ought to be aware about so you'll be a better uh, consumer of things, okay? Um, we're gonna put it through a life cycle approach uh, of different topics when you start up and as you go further through. And we'll sort of give it to you as you encounter them. The first is gonna be the startup idea stage, intellectual property, talking about who owns things, something about intellectual property. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, types of IP, okay? So there we are, types of IP, the f intellectual property. The first one is none, you don't do anything. It's not a good thing to do normally. And it ranges from trade secret, trademark, copyright, patent, and combinations. We'll dig into each of these. But as a bigger picture, the idea of a trade secret is something that can prevent others in the sense that they don't know it. Trademark and copyright can enhance value, but they don't block anything. And we'll, we'll, we'll explain what that means. Patents cuts both ways in the sense that you in order to get a patent, you have to disclose something. And so you're sort of letting something out. But the patent itself, if it's well written, can prevent others. Sort of from a bigger picture viewpoint, if you look at what the duration of this protection is, patents are the shortest, 20 years from the date of filing in the US of the application, to a trade secret, which can be indefinite as long as it's not been disclosed. Uh, from a cost viewpoint, uh, patents are the most expensive. Uh, of all of these. And uh, so those are the things to keep in mind as you're trying to think, what am I trying to protect to enhance value in the company? So let's go through those. Trade secret is something that is a secret. <laughs> and it's something proprietary that you use for yourself and you, nobody else can do it because they don't know about it. And the classic is the formula for Coca-Cola, which apparently is still a secret. Um, the protection, uh, it varies from state to state, and it's only good for you as long as you keep it a trade secret. So with trade secrets, if you're going to explain things to people, you really need non-disclosure agreements if you're really going to get into that level of detail. Um, certainly don't put anything in your business plans or pitch decks that are, are secrets. Figure out a way if you have to convince people that you, if I say to you, I've, I've invented anti-gravity boots and, you know, I don't tell you how I do it, I still might get your interest. So you sort of keep it out. Um, trademark, service mark. So at, uh, a trademark is for goods, and a service mark is for services. And these are things that the consumer, relevant consumer, associates with a, with, with a source. And it can be anything from a, a word, logo, a color, put a copy of the, the color on the bottom of the shoes there is actually trademark. So if you are a manufacturer of shoes and you put a, a shoe out there with a red color underneath like that, you'll be infringing the trademark for that, for that shoe. And sounds can actually um, uh, be trademark also. Uh, now, the kind of marks are there, are, there are things called house marks, which are uh, the company and then there are uh, product marks, which are products under it. And I've colored here, uh, IBM is a trademark for IBM as a company, uh, a source, and product ThinkPad um, used to be owned by IBM, the ThinkPad computers. The reason I left it there under IBM is you can't sell a trademark separate from the underlying business. So IBM sold the ThinkPad uh, and the whole business to Lenovo. So if you buy a, a ThinkPad today, it says Lenovo on it. Uh, Virtual Ink is our, our case, and Mimeo was the name of the product. And uh, MGM um, has a trademark on the lion's roar, if you've ever seen that. So if you were to set up a movie studio, you couldn't use the lion's roar. Uh, that would be the studio mark, and Rocky is a movie 
that MGM put out. So if you try to do anything uh, related to movies or, or videos with Rocky on it, you could be infringing their, um, their trademark. Now, the rights to a trademark uh, arise from use in commerce. Um, and until probably 10 years ago, you actually had to use the mark in commerce before you could uh, register it. And we'll talk about registration in a moment. Now there's a, a thing called intent to use. And, and the reason for that is, you know, if you're going to launch a product and you spend a lot of time getting the product ready, and then you have to, you know, ship it to show that you've sold it in commerce, and then you only find out at that point that someone else, you know, is going to be able to block your mark because there's a prior mark or something, it's very expensive. So you can now file an intent to use saying, I want to use this mark for these goods or services, and then you have a period of time to, win, in, to actually do it, and then when you do it, you file a separate thing. Now, federal registration is the way to protect a mark across the entire country. By the way, all these uh, intellectual property things we're talking about are country by country. So if you have a trademark in the US, it doesn't mean you're protected in Canada, unless you have a separate uh, registered trademark in Canada. There's country by country. Uh, if you start using a name or something with a, a product or service and you haven't gone through the process of registering it, you just put a little TM next to it the first time you use it uh, in, a, in a document or, or something, every time you use it in a document or sales a brochure, etc. And SM, if it's a service mark, just right above you know, the, uh, the word to the right. And when you register it and you get official registration with the um, uh, Patent and Trademark Office, uh, then you can put the R in the circle. Now, um, if you get a federal registration, as I said, it covers you across the whole country. Uh, but if there are people localized that have used that mark, you can't necessarily enforce it against them. So an example of that was McDon there was a McDonald's restaurant uh, in upstate New York. And it had been there before the Golden Arches uh, was formed. McDonald Golden Arches got a, a, a um, registration for McDonald's across the country, but they couldn't prevent the localized restaurant from using the name because it was a senior user. But if you do it uh, federally, you'll get coverage across the whole country except for those prior users. Uh, you want to pick sort of a fanciful mark. Um, uh, Apple, iPod would be good ones, or uh, Mimeo in the case of uh, Virtual Ink. Uh, don't pick one that's merely descriptive. If you're, if you're actually mere, merely descriptive, you may not even get the mark. So uh, years ago, uh, somebody asked me to try to get a trademark on the word microdose for use uh, as low-dose aspirin uh, for preventing heart attacks. And the patent office said, well, you're merely describing what, you can't get a mark on something that describes exactly what it does. So, you know, we're not going to allow that. So if your storage technology or analog devices, you know, that's sort of, those are actual names of what they do. They're not strong marks if they get them. Um, and you can check to see if marks are available. There are services that will, um, you can pay. Uh, but you go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. They have a database, and you type in what you think you're looking for uh, and um, see if it's available for the, goods and services you're getting it for. So there may be a, another mark for something totally different, uh, but you're looking at it for these sets of goods or services. A classic case there was um, uh, Alpha, the um, uh, Polaroid instant camera back in the day. Um, and um, Alpha, the high-end photography camera. One was a, a consumer product that was sold at Walmart, and the other one would be at a uh, you know, a professional photographer, sort. and the AGFA, the, the professional one, sued uh, Polaroid, saying, you know, you can't use Alpha for cameras because it would be confusing. And that went to trial and everything, and it was determined, yes, in fact, they could, because nobody would ever confuse uh, a lot of evidence and stuff. Nobody would ever walk into a Mar uh, Walmart thinking they were buying a high-end professional camera uh, that was totally different looking. So. That case went on for a while. But it, you, you associate a mark with a set of goods or services. Are we OK on that? Any questions at this point? Yeah. Um, how long is the registration good for? And if something is like there's the intent to use, but it's not being used, at what point does it expire? 
Yeah, yeah I forget. I have to check on the intent to use. question is, on intent to use, to start off, you know, do you have to use it within a certain period? I think it's a couple of years. I, I'd have to go look that up. But the point is, enough time to, to bring it to market. And trademarks can be indefinite. You just have to keep uh, using and, and. But if they, they're not used, like at what point does it lapse? Oh, if you abandon them, it'll, it'll lapse. If you're not, you know, you have to, you have to file, uh, periodically you have to file something saying I'm continuing to use it. Yeah. You mentioned before that trademarks um, go to protect in the same way that a patent does. So mm -hmm. how do you keep someone from using iPod uh, for their product? Well, you'd have, so how do, would you have, well, you have a, a trademark, and if someone else tries to use that mark, uh, same term or something confusingly similar on the same types of goods, then you can bring uh, a suit against them for trademark infringement. Wait, how is that different, different from the way that a patent protects your idea? We'll talk about that in a moment. So this is, because you could have a totally different, pro you could have a shoe that looks different than the shoe that I showed up there, the high heels, but with a red thing, and then people would say, well, that's a different shoe, but isn't it by the same company? Because people associate that with it. Yeah. You have do not take descriptive words or phrases. And the name of my company is We Grow Micro <laughs> OK. Why the, not phrases? OK. So the question is, don't pick, uh, you say, don't pick uh, descript, merely descriptive things. And the name of your company is something. I won't say it. We Okay, we grow microgreens. There's a difference between a company name and the trademark. So everyone knows Tide. Who owns Tide? Do, do, you, do you care? I mean, it has to be Procter & Gamble, but if Procter & Gamble sold Tide, the Tide line of business to Unilever, it's still Tide. Um, and... Um, it would, that value goes with the business. So that there's a difference between a company name and a trademark around a product or service that the company might make. It's a little confusing when I say IBM because IBM is both International Business Machines Corporation and IBM is a sort of a trademark for that type of thing. I'm going to sort of move along just because we've got a lot to cover, but I'll... Pick, pick the sound up? Yeah. Okay, can you crank the sound up uh, up there? Okay, they, I, all right, good. I'll talk, try to talk louder. Okay, so copyright. Uh, it's the right to make copies. You can prevent somebody from copying something you've done. Uh, the right to something that's created is yours as soon as you create it. Uh, it protects uh, the expression, not the idea. So you would have a copyright, say, in a play, you know, about a love triangle, right? You, if, and that's Shakespeare, right? The name of a play that's a love triangle. He can't prevent other people from using that same theme. He just can't represent it in the same way. Um, so it's a great fit for, um, say, music, uh, but maybe not for a software, which is you're trying to protect, you know, the way it's something is done. Uh, federal registration is a plus. It's not required, uh, but it is required if you're going to try to bring a suit for copyright infringement. Um, the key thing for entrepreneurs is to make sure you actually have rights in what you think you do. So the copyright author is the owner of the copyright, unless he or she is doing that in the course of business uh, uh, for an employee, for an employer. And even there, it's typical to get an agreement where uh, people assigned as part of their employment arrangement their, their uh, copyrights uh, to the employer. Uh, you don't have to do that. It's a good practice to. On the other hand, if you go out and you hire an independent contractor to write some code for you, uh, the person is not an employee, the contractor owns the copyright, say, in software that he or she writes um, because he or she's the author. Now, if you do it under a contract that says, I'm hiring you to write this stuff for me as a work for hire, then you will own it, not the um, software writer. So you want to have a written contract with, an, with a, um, uh, a contractor 
who you, you hire to do stuff for you. This came up, I had, back in the day, I had a, um, a company that did import-export uh, uh, brokering. They spent a half a million dollars um, to get some software system for that written for them. Uh, and it worked just fine. And the next thing you know, they found that their competitors were using the same system. And they called me up and said, well, how can they do that? And it turned out they could because they never had a contract. So we had to rattle some stavers and stuff. But the fact is, you know, the, they wrote it for the first company and they went and sold it for, to everyone else because they could. So as an as a entrepreneur, you want to make sure you own uh, the software or, or the, any copyright. And then you want to check for open source issues because you can build businesses on top of open source, but you have to follow the license about how you, how you use open source in your, in your product. OK, we OK on this? Copyright? All right. Uh, OK, patents. This is a little bit longer. It's a little more involved. It's a, fed, it's a country by country, in this case, federally US. I'm going to talk about US only right here. Um, granted right to any system, method, et cetera that's new, obvious, new, non-obvious, and useful. Um, it's very much like real estate. And I'll show you that in a moment. The, right you, the fundamental right you get when you have a patent is to prevent other people from practicing your invention as described in the patent and claimed in the patent. It doesn't mean necessarily you, could, you can actually practice your own invention. So why is that? Well, suppose. I have a piece of property, and uh, all around my property is property you own. I can prevent you from walking on my property from trespassing, but I can't necessarily get to my property if I have to walk across your land. So it's a right to exclude. Um, the claims of the patent are like the fence around the property. The key part of a patent are the claims. What have you claimed? So here's a, oops. Oops, sorry, here we go. Uh, and the duration is uh, in the US 20 years from the date of filing of the application for a patent, uh, 14 years for a design patent. So here's an example about the right to exclude. Let's say you patent a vessel to hold a liquid. It's, let's say you can get that because nobody ever, it's new, it's not obvious, and it's useful. And you get a patent on that. And I come along and I say, uh, gee, I'd like to patent. I think that, that vessel to hold the liquid would be better if I could put a handle on it. And I get a patent on the handle. What we have here is a mutual standoff. Neither of us can put, can, can market, can, can build something that's a vessel with a handle. Because I, I could prevent you from putting a handle on your, on your cup. And you can prevent, uh, uh, sorry, putting a, my handle on your cup. And you could prevent me from putting your cup on my handle. So it's a right to exclude. Is that clear how it is? Yeah. Is it the same thing when you are referring another patent? Well, it's when you what? It's the same, like I'm building something and do reference to another patent? We'll talk about, yeah, we'll talk about prior, prior art and reference. This is really, if you had each of these, the point here is, um, it's the right to exclude. The only way we could get a cup with a handle would be a license, a cross license, or from one to the other. Right, and I'll show you what we call a picket fence in a few slides here. There's another strategy. Yep. Well, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, OK? All right, so let's look at the requirements. It has to be novel. That means something uh, new. And you have, to, you, look, you have to search. You have an obligation to bring to the attention of the patent office any prior art, they call it, of which you're aware that's relevant to determine whether your invention is new. Prior art could be uh, other patents. It could be papers or other things out there. Uh, that are relevant. And typically, you'll see that in a patent itself. You'll say, um, in the description of, of the patent, it'll say, um, you know, um, it, currently people are doing this, and, 
and they'll describe the prior art and they'll say, but the, there are some limitations of this and my invention is a better way to do this and here's what I claim. And so prior art has to be novel. It has to be useful. That's really not a bar. Most things are useful. I have not really seen one. Um, it has to be patentable subject matter. And this is a big, it's a process machine manufacturer, a composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof. There's a lot of stuff going on in the courts today about uh, what is patentable, the business methods patents, and these things go up and down. The, the Supreme Court has put out there some statements, and the lower courts are trying to implement them, and the Supreme Court's overriding them, and so it's sort of a mess for a lot of things around uh, software and related things. Uh, so just simply doing something on a computer that people did manually itself is currently not viewed as something that's patentable subject matter. So you have to do some transformation of process. We won't get into all the technical details on it, but it's, it's an area that's a, a, a potential problem. Yeah. For something that's novel, how do you search through all the, the prior art to make sure that it is novel? Has yeah, how do you know it's novel? I'll show you in a moment. <laughs> OK. Um, now, it can't previously have been sold or publicly described uh, in order as part of the requirements. So in most countries, in fact, every other country in the world in which I'm aware, if you publicly disclose your invention uh, before you file an application, you cannot get a patent in that country. The US has a one-year window where if I disclose the invention, I have one year in which to get a an application on file. So it's sort of a grace period. Um, and it relates to an enabling disclosure. We had an MIT professor with, at Venture Mentoring Service uh, who had this really interesting thing, and, and we, uh, they came and talked to me about it. And you know, I listened to what he said. I said, look, I'm not a patent lawyer, but I, I, think you, you, I don't think you've actually disclosed the invention. Um, because he thought it was sort of intuitively obvious kind of thing. And I said, you know, go talk to a patent lawyer. They did, and uh, he had given a paper, but the paper wasn't uh, enough disclosure of what the invention was. And they ended up getting a patent. They launched a company, and they sold it for a quarter of a billion dollars three years later. So um, he was thinking, you know, I couldn't even get a patent. Um, now, um, so no enabling disclosure. Um, and you have one year in the US only. Um, it has to be not obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art, and that's where the issue was. The professor thought this was obvious, but the standard was of one of ordinary skill in the art, and he was obviously at the top of his game. Um, we're under a new regime. It used to be in the US that the first to invent won, and there's some interesting cases back there about it. We're now under a system like the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world is the first inventor to file wins can get the patent. So if, if Yoast invented something and I, end up, I can't copy him, I actually have to have invented it, I could invent it separately, uh, and I get to the patent office before he does, even though he invented it before I did, I win, as long as we were both inventors. So. There is a bunch of strategies now about getting filings on, and we'll talk about provisional patents here in a moment. Um, so you want to think about IP in the context of, uh, you know, getting a patent's nice. You get your name there. You can say, I have patents. The real question is, does it add value to what you're doing? Or does, do other forms of IP? And so you want to think about, you know, what is your IP strategy? If you have a core technology that's really key and you can get a strong patent on it, then you might want to be spending time to do that. If you've got a, if there's a risk of, of the product being reverse engineered, you, that might be something where you want to get a patent on it because uh, if you can claim it broad enough, somebody could figure out how you do it uh, but can't actually do it because you can prevent them. Um, and the question is also how fast the market's moving. If you have a very short-lived product, um, you know, it, might, it takes anywhere from two to three years to get a patent or more. And so it may not make sense. Uh, your business model will also have a, a, a bearing on what you're doing. If you're gonna manufacture stuff, you, you may be, do it behind closed doors and it's a trade secret, so you don't really need a, a patent. Um, if it's a process, 
getting a patent is kind of hard to figure out because um, although you can get patent a process, how do you ever prove someone used your process? So the classic case was a golf ball. And somebody had a patent on a way to make a golf ball, and somebody else went off and made a golf ball using that. How did they actually prove that the two golf balls were used with the same process? It's a little hard to do. So process patents don't usually get patented. They're kept as trade secret. If you're going to license your technology, you, you do want to have something to license, so a patent would make sense. Now, there may be non-IP bars to market entry uh, that uh, will protect you as much or, or more than just getting a patent if they're regulatory things. Uh, and then you want to think what your exit strategy is. Certainly for most technology ventures where people are buying uh, companies uh, for their technology, you do want to have some patents and a strategy that shows that you know what you're doing. Um, so uh, you want to make sure you have what's called, uh, do you have freedom to operate? Uh, even if you're not going to get a patent, uh, can you actually do it? That's the prior art that the question was. We'll show that in a moment. Um, and do you actually own it? Uh, did the inventor, uh, again, well, sort of like copyright, the inventor is the owner of the patent unless he or she has assigned it uh, to somebody. So again, if you're a technical employee, you probably, and you work for a company, you probably had an invention assignment agreement um, that you've, that you've uh, signed. Uh, is it licensed from a university? And we'll, show, we'll talk a little bit about licensing from university in a moment. Uh, and did it go into the public domain? Did you do something that put it in the public domain? I was um, in Istanbul about five or six years ago uh, on a program that tried to develop uh, entrepreneurial capacity in primarily Muslim countries. And there were a bunch of uh, teams from around the world. And I was meeting with an, an Egyptian team. And they were showing me the pitch. I was you know, giving them some advice on the pitch. And I asked them, did they have any patents? It was a device to increase the uh, throughput of wireless networks by 10 times, you know, some pretty interesting thing. And they said, no, they were thinking about it. And I said, well, have you, have you published anything about it? Oh, yeah, I was very proud. He had a published paper about how they did it. And I said, you know, maybe, maybe in the US you'll be able to get a patent if we get one on file quickly. But the rest of the world, you're not going to be able to get a patent if that paper describes what you're trying to invent. And it was so sad to see his face sort of drop. You know, because they didn't understand that. So that's a red flag. You know, do not disclose until you file. Um, and then, strat uh, because patents are expensive, as I'll give you some numbers, you may want to disclose to prevent others from patenting. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, and this is basically uh, from an, an investor viewpoint. They're going to ask, you know, do you have IP? It was interesting when they. When the markets were moving very quickly, when the internet bubble was happening, uh, companies were being flipped in 18 months. Hotmail, I think, was founded and sold in 18 months for $400 million. We couldn't get funding for things like medical devices because those took longer. Um, and the venture capitalists didn't really care. They were just trying to ride the market as fast as they could. These days, though, they are looking at whether you have IP and how good it is. And so you do want to make sure you have a story there. Um, so prior art, how do you figure it out? This is uh, one of the specialties you get for this course. One of the companies that I founded, co-founded is called IP Vision. And it was because we were frustrated at trying to figure out um, what was out there in the world and to try to make business decisions. We, we would go to a law firm and we'd get a freedom to operate opinion, which would be you know, a whole bunch of pages, a lot of money. And uh, perfectly accurate, but to the extent it went, but useless to figure out what's there. So we invented um, this mapping technology. That's the uh, uh, website, seetheforest.com. You can register there. And because you're uh, in the class, if you want to upgrade to premium for free, uh, send me an email, and, and uh, we can do that. But what is this stuff? This is Virtual Ink. This is one of their key patents here. Let's see if I can. Put the, uh, so right here, that's the, the, the metaphor here is the horizontal axis is time. Uh, each of these boxes is a, a patent. The left edge of the box is the date it was uh, issued or published if it was an application. 
The tail is when it was filed. And the, the lines connecting the box are what are called citation references. So remember I said in order to get a patent, you, you have to cite prior art of which you're aware. And if you fail to cite that prior art and it comes to the attention of the patent office, it can be the basis for invalidating uh, the patent. It's called fraud in the patent office. So there's a real incentive to make sure you get things cited. So if you took it, take and look at all the citations, you begin to understand who's in the space and what they're doing. Uh, in this case, uh, when Yonald filed his patent or issued patent, he cited uh, uh, what, a number, all of these patents as prior art. And in the boxes, they'll say 32 comma 1, let's say. That means there are 32 patents it cited. And, and at the time, maybe there was one patent that cited it. So when a patent first issues, there's not going to be anything to cite it, because that's out of here. Um, and then a few years later, so here's, here's an example when he cited, uh, the, he cited these, these companies uh, own the, some of these patents here. So these are people that he needs to be worried about. Uh, so the, the prior art citations um, are a combination of the inventor and the patent examiner. So when you file a patent, it gets sent to a, a technical group that knows something about it. So we want a mechanical engineer looking at mechanical engineering stuff instead of biotech. And so those, those examiners know what's, what's there. And so they'll cite things also. So that combination creates this sort of landscape. Now, several years later, once other patents came along, these are people that cited Yonald's patent. And by looking at those, you can begin to track what competitors are doing and asking questions. Are these, uh, are these competitors? Are they potential collaborators? Could they be acquirers? Just by following that. Here's what his portfolio looked uh, like at one point, uh, where these yellow ones are the 12 patents that he managed to get. And all these other ones are people that are citing back to him. Uh, and you can see here are additional people who might be of interest. Yeah, the assignee is, uh, so the inventor is the inventor, uh, one or more uh, people, right? And then they'll assign it to an employer or it could be assigned from a, it's an asset. Once a pat patent's an asset, unlike a trademark, which has to be uh, only transferred with the whole business, you could, you could sell a patent to somebody, just sell it or give it to them. Um, so you, we call it the front page assignee is the company name or the organization name that will appear on the front page of the patent when it's published. And then the current assignee is whoever owns it now, and those could be different. In fact, Google, when it was building out its portfolio, Google came out of an academic institution, right? So um, it, as it started to get going, it started to buy portfolios. It bought a bunch from IBM. Uh, it bought Motorola primarily for the patent portfolio and then sold off the business. And this is This was... 2012, I ran this one uh, this morning. This is the same 12 patents, but look all the additional activity here in the seven years hence. So you can actually track what's happening to a technology area and see how it morphs over time. Um, okay, um, so uh, if you wanna do these, go to See the Forest, register and then send me an email. Not necessarily. So um, the monolithic accelerometer from um, analog devices is the uh, MEMS device uh, uh, that uh, has an accelerometer on it that fires airbags when you deaccelerate. They cited a ton of patents in the past. And I thought, you know, the more things you cite, it means it must be a very narrow invention because look at all this prior art. Uh, but I talked to their lawyers and they said, no, no, we were trying to cite as much as we could and get it in the record. Because once you've cited that and the patent office has granted you the patent, it becomes harder for someone to invalidate it over that prior art. The assumption is the patent office did its job correctly. And in fact, there was a, a point of time there. We just, we filed some patents for another company I co-founded uh, two years ago. We cited 895 other patents as prior art. And um, 
that was an exercise. But we got it granted, uh, it was issued in um, last May in US, China, and Europe. Um, so let's talk about obtaining a patent. Um, you want to figure out what to patent, when to file, and talk, we'll talk a little bit about how do you prepare these things. Um, again, and we've touched on this before, why, why do you want it? You want it because it's going to protect something. It's going to protect your revenue stream. It's going to pr prevent other people from getting into the market. And um, uh, that's the kind of questions you want to ask. We, we have a tendency to think it's really cool technology and we should patent it. And that may be very, very uh, true, but the question is, patents are expensive. I'll show you some numbers. Um, and you don't have an unlimited budget, so you have to think strategically about it. Um, you want to file before you lose US or foreign rights. I've talked about that one year, or the public disclosure. And under the first to invent uh, thing, it didn't matter how quickly you got to the patent office as long as you were diligent. Now it does make a difference. And so um, a couple of years ago, I was working with a major consumer products company. Uh, on a project and they said, oh, we're bringing this other product to market. Could you do you know, a prior, could you do a search to let us know what's going there? Well, it turned out they had been working on this for 18 months. They, had, they came up with a concept. They got a focus groups, so all the kind of things Bob talked about. Um, they engineered it and then as they were getting ready to go to market, only then did they file, decide they were gonna file an application. In that period, in that 18 months while they were working on it, Three other people filed patents that essentially blocked what they did. If they'd filed it earlier, they would have been okay. So they wasted 18 months and I don't know how many million dollars for that. And you think, gee, that's really stupid, but I ran into another major consumer products company that I'm working with now, and you know, I, had, I have to go and convince their lawyers that you can't wait until you're ready to go to market because someone else, if you're in an area that's moving fast, is gonna come in and file something before you. So you wanna make sure you, you get on with it. And one way to do it, because they're expensive, is what's called a provisional patent application. So remember I said in the US you have one year from the time you publicly disclose or hold out for sale uh, a product uh, to file an application, and that's, that's good for the US. The rest of the world says, no, no, if you haven't filed something, uh, and you can't, you've lost rights. So the provisional was put in and, and is called a filing for purposes of most countries in the world. So a provisional application doesn't even have to have claims in it. I've seen people going to conferences and slapping a cover page on a paper and filing it. It, uh, it gives you filing date priority you still have to file your final application within a year. It's pretty cheap. If you're a micro filer, $70 to put it. Nothing really happens at the, the patent office. They don't examine it. Um, and the risk is, if you talk to patent lawyers, they'll say, well, you know, you really want to do a full application because you, know, you want to get everything in there. Well, yeah, maybe if you had unlimited time and money. And time is often the issue because you've got your engineers working on stuff. Um, when we were developing the IP Vision system, it's a software as a service. So we were doing release cycles every four to six weeks. And we would have a, a, a meeting before the, we uh, released the code and we'd say, what did we do that we think is important? And we'd file a provisional on that. What did we think about doing or learned during that period that we think we might want to do, we'd file a provisional on that. And that would give us a year protection. And we did that every four to six months. Now, 12 months out, we had to sit there and say, okay, now, which one of these provisionals are we gonna take forward? Uh, but at least we preserve rights and it was pretty inexpensive. And it was actually useful um, as a strategy to have the team come together and say, you know, what is it unique that we're doing? You know, and it helped us focus on not only a patent thing, but on actual what we were going to develop. Um, if you've, how many people have ever read a patent? Okay, anybody have one? Okay, good. So you know, you know how painful that is. <laughs> but basically, it, you, you, Not everyone should. Everyone should. Yeah. So what? Why do we get a? Why do we have a patent system? 
Anybody? Freedom to operate. Sorry? Freedom to operate. Freedom to operate. Okay. What, I'm not quite sure. Okay, yeah. Disclosing what your invention is about allows other people to build on that right. knowledge and improve on um, past knowledge rather than keeping it secret and never making it better. Okay, and it, it goes back to the Constitution. The Constitution has a provision to protect inventors. The idea, so the, the big societal thing here is you're not going to disclose. We, want to, we society want to encourage you, an inventor, to disclose your invention so we expand knowledge and people can build on it, like you said. Why would you ever want to disclose it if somebody could copy it? So the trade-off is you disclose and we give you a limited time monopoly to prevent others from practicing your invention. That's, that's a societal bargain out there. Um, and that limited time monopoly is the 20 years from the date of filing. So the whole purpose in a patent is to describe what is your invention, you know, why, what's broken that you've, you're fixing, and to describe it in a way that other people can use it down the road. And you have to disclose the best mode of practicing your invention. And then the claims describe exactly what your invention is. And that's, that's a negotiation with the patent office. And when the examiner says, well, you know, I, this, this prior art, this patent, or this paper, um, uh, anticipate your art, you go back and forth, and the claims get amended, and then eventually you hopefully get something that you think uh, is, is, is strong. Uh, so that's the whole purpose, and that's sort of what's in a patent. Um, the costs, uh, a lot of this is labor, right? So 5000 to 15000 for preparing an application, the full utility application, as it's called, is not unusual. I had Knowing something about this, uh, when we were doing the IP Vision one, I got a bill from the law firm for $35,000 for preparing the application. I said, what in the world? Well, my co-founder was thinking about stuff and calling the lawyers directly. And the lawyers, of course, bill by the hour. So, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And so I had to go to him and say, you don't call the patent lawyer. You come through me. And we, <laughs> because the lawyers just kept cranking it up. And I said, you know, never again are you going to, give me a bill that's $35,000 that I know nothing about. <laughs> um, so that's to get it into the patent office. Once it's in there, you don't know how much it's going to cost. It really depends on the examiner and how long it takes. It can be anywhere from five, fifteen, hundred thousand dollars $100,000. It's really hard to determine. Foreign applications can get very expensive because you have to file in each country. There was a general accounting office study in about uh, early 2000s that said for a small company uh, where, where the fees were less to take, depending on the, on the nature of the invention, to file in the US and 10 industrialized countries that they picked ran anywhere from uh, $300,000 to $500,000 over the life of the patent because you have to, not only the initial issue costs, but you have to file maintenance fees and everything else. So they are expensive. And you want to use them judiciously. Yes. Can, can you say something about emerging markets? <clears throat> China, yep. India, Africa, China, ASEAN. Yep. These are all either countries that are not on your list or agglomerations of countries yep. where the growth is fast and thus the prospect for invention matters. It does. And, and those, the, so the question is, what about emerging countries like China and, or think rapidly growing countries? And so the, the issue had been in the current trade debate, it's the theft of intellectual property. You know, it was one of the things people are talking about. And there was a, a big concern that the Chinese uh, system really, you know, why would you ever file in China? It's a corrupt system. They don't enforce stuff. Well, in fact, they have been doing it. They realize the value of it. Um, and so we have um, applications for the current thing that I'm working on. Uh, we have the issued patent in China. We have applications in Korea, uh, Japan. Uh, we're passing on India uh, because it's not within it. But our collaboration partner uh, wants to file all over Europe. So we got a core European patent. And so what you want to do is file where you think your market is going to be. 
because one of the rights you have as a patent, or a patent holder is to prevent others from making, using, or importing the invention. So I can't take something that's patented in the US over to China and make it in China and bring it back into the US. That would be an infringement. I could take a patent in the US, the patented technology, go to China, and if there was no other patent, uh, no uh, Chinese patent, I could make it there, and I could sell it in China. So it's country by country. But, uh, so you want to protect uh, your, your business in where you think your business is going to be, and that's a cost-benefit, like anything else, trade-off. Um, so because they're expensive, um, you have to think about disclosure as a strategy. So if you have something very unique and you have your patent lawyer decides that you can get a very strong patent or patent, patents, you want to make sure that you're free to operate, that someone else can't do a picket fence around you. So here's an example of a, going back to our vessel to hold a liquid. Let's say you're, you have a vessel to hold a liquid, and I think that's great. That's really great. Now what could I do? I could come and I could say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to patent a cap to go on it. And I'm going to patent a sleeve to go around it. I'm going to patent a handle and maybe a styrofoam container. Now what I've done is I've blocked you from doing any of those things to take that vessel, that cup to market. So if you think you could get a very strong cup patent, you might want to disclose all of these things. And you can do it in your, in your, in your patent. You can do it just by announcing it. I've got a vessel to hold a liquid, and many things could be done with this. You could put a sleeve on it to keep it warm or keep it from burning the, the, the consumer, a cap, maybe a handle, and you disclose that. And once you've disclosed it, it's prior art, so someone else can't come along and patent those and block you. That's pretty easy to do. I think of it as you've got a castle, and you want to burn out the brush in front of the castle so no one could get in. Okay, so disclosure is a strategy. It's inexpensive if you think you have a strong core position. Yep. So then you cannot also file a patent too, right? You, you, will, you will begin to file out, you cannot even file all. Well, you could file a patent on all that if you want, but assuming you don't have an unlimited budget, you could patent the candle, you could patent the, the, the top, the sleeve, but maybe you don't have the money to do that. Um, as a startup, you know, you've got, or even an operating company. Disclosing could be a good way to prevent others from blocking you. That's, that's the point. But, but in the future, you will, you will, you, because there is also uh, whether you should fight, you should destroy it, or you just wait and fire it later. So how will you choose, you know? Well, <laughs> once you, remember, once you, your patent is published, yeah. or the application, you've disclosed what it is you're patenting, yeah. right? So if I see your vessel to hold a liquid, and I'm, I'm fast, I can think, well, what can I do with that? And I could run around and file all those other things. So you, you have control over your strategy, or you should have control over it. And it's, it's simply an economic uh, trade-off. Yeah, let me take one more before we move on. Um, and you use disclosure to, to prevent someone from patenting a technology that doesn't exist in that form yet, right? Can you suggest a technology that might improve on your invention or make it very interesting yep. in a different way um, in your disclosure, even though that doesn't exist? Anymore. Well, you have to disclose enough about it so someone could practice your invention. Right. So I can't say uh, anti-gravity boots without saying something. Okay. However, it, you, could, you could both patent a, a strategy if you have, let's say there are three different ways you might uh, address a problem in the market. And to Bob's entry point, his triangle, your first one is going to be a simple approach that you can get there quickly. And, but you have other things you think you could do, maybe a totally different technology that's not really cost effective yet. You know, it's, not, it's, the, it's the cup of oil the other night, right? Um, you could still patent that as a core thing, even though you may not get to it for a while. Um, and if you get a broad enough one, it could prevent someone else from writing, a, you know, uh, uh, say, take sensors. Ten years ago, sensors were, you know, they were there. They weren't as cheap as they are now. And so if you would plan things with sensors. So to go back to analog devices, that MEMS chip, you know, they're a very much engineering-run company, a great company, great engineering. 
but they were ahead of the curve with that chip. And if they had thought about patenting systems enabled by such chips, they could have probably prevented other people from putting an, uh, um, other chips, MEMS type chips made with different technologies or whatever that wouldn't have infringed their core. They might have been able to prevent them from incorporating those in a system for an airbag, say. So there's some strategies like that. We have to think, how do I provide real protection? An example of a, a disclosure of a picket fence is this patent. This is, a, you've heard of Ring, the video doorbell that I think was bought by Amazon for a billion dollars. Uh, that's one of their patents. All these red patents is a company called Skybell. And I don't know when the suits are going to start flying. When I talked to the Ring CEO, he wasn't concerned at all about his patent position. And I said, you're not worried about Skybell? <laughs> nope. <laughs> he was just trying to sell it to Amazon as fast as he could. <laughs> but that's an example. When you see a map like that, you'd say, what in the world is Skybell doing? Should I, if you're investing in a company, should I be investing in Ring or Skybell? Well, maybe, maybe Skybell is the right company. Uh, there are other things to consider if you're investing, but you know, from a patent position. So anyway, okay, so here's some practical advice on IP, um, just because I'm running fast here. So um, here's sort of a checklist. For employees, you want to get invention disclosure and assignment agreements from your employees, just to make sure that they understand that they're working for you and the work that they do that you're paying them for, you're going to own and you get actual assignments. So if you if they run off and you can't track them down, you at least have a document. For consultants or third parties, non-employees, you want to make sure you have an agreement that says it's a work for hire and an agreement where they agree to assign. Now, if you're a software, if your business is developing software and you get one of these consulting agreements, it's going to say everything you do is owned by your client. And you're going to go through a dance saying, well, I can't not everything I do is going to be owned by you. I've got core tools that I use that I incorporate. And so I can't, you can't own all of that because I already own that. And so you have to go through a dance with them to make sure you specify exactly what it is that they're going to own so they don't effectively put you out of business. Um, you want to get non-disclosure agreements with third parties where appropriate. Um, I was yesterday with a company in the cybersecurity space that I've been uh, mentoring for a number of years, and uh, they're going to go talk to a public company where I think the two of them have a lot to discuss, and they're going to they're sign a non-disclosure agreement in order to get to the details. Now, there, will, there will be no discussion about you know, what the technology is without that uh, non-disclosure agreement going both ways. You want to avoid infringement. Make sure you have a freedom to operate. Uh, there is a, in, in the, when, if you willfully infringe a patent and you can, be, uh, you can be assessed triple damages plus attorney's fees, which could be a lot, <laughs> depending on what it is. And so you typically will get a freedom to operate opinion from a law firm, because with an opinion that says, you know, we've looked at the, your patent, and we've looked at what's out there, and we think you're free to operate, you're not going to infringe anybody, is in our opinion. Now, it may be you, in fact, do infringe. Um, or there may be patents that are uh, not yet issued. Because when patents are, are filed, they aren't published or made public for 18 months. So you don't know what's in there. And in fact, if you only want to get a patent only in the US, you can keep it hidden and uh, non-published until it actually grants. So you're never 100% sure. But if you get an opinion from a lawyer saying, it's my opinion that you know, you're free to operate, then if it does, in fact, turn out that you've infringed, you won't be assessed treble damages. So it's like an insurance policy. Um, you should understand the patent landscape, and you can do that with some of the tools that I showed you. What kind of, what kind of conclusion did the lawyer take of that document they tell you that you have freedom, you have freedom to operate? I'm sorry, what kind of? What kind of responsibility a patent lawyer has? Well, they're, they're issuing a legal opinion, and, and you know it's based on facts. And if they're, it's an opinion. And if they're, they're wrong, uh, if, they're, uh, if they're negligent in it, you can sue them for, for negligence. But and on these things, it's often, what happens is you say, I'm going to do this. But when you actually go into the market, you actually do something different. 
right? So in a vendor agreement, if I'm supplying you with a component and you ask me for a patent indemnification saying if, if, uh, if you're held liable because you use my uh, component, then I'm going to make, make you whole. I'm going to pay you. The problem is I don't know where you're going to put that. If, you, if, you, if I give you a handle and you put the handle on the cup, then I'm not responsible for it. You were the one that did it. See, so when you're getting a freedom to operate opinion, you, don't, you, have, you have to make some assumptions about what they're doing with it, and the, pat, and the technology may change. Uh, but you don't want to willfully go forward, not only because of the liability, but why would you want to take that risk? You know, you might look at a different, as Bob said, you're the jockey, maybe you need a different horse. Um, you want to preserve your patent rights. Think about using provisionals. Uh, which, by the way, you don't really need a patent lawyer. The, the risk that I said was that if you, uh, when you go to file the, the official patent from your provisional, you've got to, you can't add things and claim that they were from the provisional. So what does that mean? So suppose I said, um, I've, I'm the only person that ever discovered that fruits and vegetables are healthy for you. And I file a provisional patent application. And then when it comes 12 months later, I'm going to file you know, the full one, I can't then go and say, oh, and by the way, steak is good for you too. Because that wasn't in the provisional. So that's a risk with provisionals. That's why you might want to, as you're thinking through a project, you might want to file uh, a number of them. And well, if I said uh, vegetables, uh, fruits and vegetables are, are good for you, then when I file my official patent, then I'm going to claim priority to the provisional because I talked about fruits and vegetables back then. No, no, it, I, I mean, while you have this well on, you can't have claims to your provisional. No, you don't add claims to, there's no claims in provisionals. They don't have to be. You file a new thing, a new, a new application. Maybe a, it will get, there's a lot of detail underneath this. I'm trying to get you at the high level to see where the red flags are. Um, you want to make sure you file in time and you want to avoid the picket fence. So. Now, when you're hiring lawyers, you're paying for expertise by the, by the hour. And so if I walk into a patent lawyer and I, I throw my lab notebook uh, and say, write me up a patent, that's going to be very expensive, right? But if I sat down and I read some patents and I wrote up the description and I tried to do the bulk of it, um, then what I really want to get the lawyer to do, the thing that's really valuable is the claims. So I want them to spend time on the claims, not on all the other stuff. So um, you want to have a disciplined approach. You want to make sure you understand what your business goals are. You want to make sure you keep the attorney informed. If you have a provisional and you wait until 11 months and 28 days and you call up the lawyer and say, I need to get a utility patent on, that's going to cost super fat. It's going to cost you a lot more than if you even told them I'm going to be filing, asking you to file a utility on it next month so they can put it in their work schedule and everything. Um, Is there any reason to let a lawyer to file a provisional? I, I don't think you need a lawyer to file a provisional. It certainly. Is there any reason? Is there any reason? Yeah. Well, you know, they've seen. They might help you write the, what your description is in a way that make it easier for them to write the claims later on. Um, but it's still, they're gonna, most of them will try to say, well, forget the provisional, let's just do the utility right away. And so, the, you know, I, I would rather you file a provisional um, and, and not screw up deadlines and things uh, if you're budget constrained than to say, depending on the nature of what you're trying to do. So in my case, when we were doing of releases every four to six weeks, we weren't using patent lawyers for that. We knew how to write up what it was that we were doing. And we relied on the lawyers later on to, to, just, to help us write the claims, the important part defining where the, the boundaries of the property are. Um, you, wanna, um, you wanna leverage your technical expertise. And in general, dealing with lawyers in, in the materials section or the resources section, there's a thing I did, 10 Commandments of How to Work, if, effectively with lawyers, they'll save you time and money. No charge. Okay. Um, university licensing uh, background. In the US, uh, basically the federal government funds a lot of research. 
And until 1980, uh, the federal government owned all of the IP that came out of that, and it was managed out of Washington. And someone said, well, wait a second, this is kind of crazy. You know, we're not, we're not good at this. We don't even understand the invention. So the Bayh-Dole Act came along, and it said, we're going to actually uh, give the patent rights to the universities where the, art, the research is being done and make them responsible uh, and give them benefits for doing it. So uh, any work done at MIT, fed, fed, federally funded, is owned by MIT, and MIT has an IP ownership policy itself, which says uh, it owns the patent or copyright if it, significant use is made of, this is for non-federally funded research. Uh, if you're using a lot of MIT facilities, um, MIT will claim ownership if you're not using, if you're using the nuclear reactor, <laughs> that's a significant use. Um, they never assign ownership um, to a research sponsor, only a license, and they uh, guarantee sponsors. That's where commercial people, you know, contract with MIT for work. Um, so if, you, if you're in a lab at MIT, you want to make sure, and you're, and you're thinking of starting a company, you want to make sure you understand who's funding it and, and whether, um, whether you can get it. Now, MIT will waive, can waive the invention if these things happen, if they're going to sponsor rights, uh, no plans to use MIT facilities, recognizing there's a lot of brain power around here and not all of it's uh, employed doing stuff that's funded research. Um, MIT will also, in certain cases, you can donate your IP to MIT if they think it's important and they'll take ownership of it and prosecute it for you and, and um, license it in the right case. We won't go into how that all exactly works, but you should. Now for startups, um, because you might want MIT to be, um, well, first of all, if it's something really important, MIT may license it to someone and you'll get some royalties on it. Um, you may want MIT in your corner if there's a patent fight. So strategically, you might do it. And they won't take just anything. They, they have plenty of work. Their first thing is to try to, the mission of the technology licensing office is to try to make sure that the technology uh, gets out into the marketplace and benefits the world. I mean, they make some money on it, but uh, royalties, the maximizing royalties is not their first priority. Now, how do you deal with this with startups? So. You don't have, I'm going to show you some licensing terms in a couple of slides, but you don't have a whole lot of money. But let's say you go and you make a good case and you say, you know, I'm thinking of starting a company to do this with this technology that you have a patent or a patent application on. I'd like an option to license that, right? And they'll get, they may, in the right case, give you an option. It doesn't cost a whole lot. Now you put together your plan and you go out and talk to investors and you say, I, if you give me the money, I've got this team of people that are going to join me, and I've got an option to get this license, uh, this technology from MIT. So I've got all the ingredients. I just need your money. Right? And so this is an effective, can be an effective way uh, for you to sort of tie up those rights and uh, you know, have a good case for potential investors. Here are some typical license finance terms. These are about 10 years old, so just to give you an idea of, I haven't updated these. Um, there are two components. One, if you, they don't, uh, it used to be MIT would only um, do straight licenses. And that was typically to, to big companies. And then uh, when John Preston came in, he said, well, look, most of, um, most of uh, the really interesting stuff is done by small companies. And they can't afford it. So maybe we should think about taking equity as part of it. So, you know, that, they changed the whole way of possibly thinking of it. So the kind of fees you have is the issue fees. When it, when it comes time for the license to issue, they want an upfront fee. Uh, there's a maintenance fee to be paid. MIT owns the patent. They have to pay maintenance fees, so you're going to pay something for that. Uh, they want you to do something, a guarantee to do something with it, and then there's a royalty and cost. So if no equity, it looks something like this. It would be maybe, this is 10 years old, 50 to 150K maintenance fees to maintain the license would be 50, about maybe 50% of your running royalties that um, you, you get for it. Um, you can't, you have to agree not to leave it on the shelf. You know, there's a due diligence clause. If they, 
They haven't used it much, but if you really sit on it, uh, they can come in and take the license away from you. Uh, royalty is a percentage of sales, 3 to 5%. Uh, patent costs, you have to pay their patenting costs, which could be you know, anywhere, depending on where it is, whether it's an application or an issued patent. And then you don't require to sponsor any research. If you were doing it with equity, it looks something like this, a lower royalty um, and a lower upfront cost. This is, again, uh, a typical way they do it. It was a single digit royalty, percent royalty, and that is maintained uh, through the first five. The equity they take maintain, I'm sorry, the equity would be single digit, and they don't want to be diluted through the first five or 10 million of financing, whatever your business plan shows. Uh, and they want to be able to participate in future rounds. Here's some examples at the time of what. They have a they have a right to invest in a future they round. Have a right to invest, so TLO invests. Well, it's handed over to the treasurer, you know, the treasurer's office. So. And that's frequent or rare? I haven't seen it happen that often, but. Rare. Yeah, but they maintain the right. This is again ten years old. These may change, but to give you some ideas, don't. Don't assume these are accurate, but just some ideas. You can look at these are these decks are in the, um, in the materials, but I'm going to move on. Is that right? Okay, so uh, I'm always running out of time. <laughs> uh, legal entity. Let's talk quickly about that. Uh, we're not going to get through all of this tonight. <laughs> um, if you do nothing, first of all, we're all we're all liable for our own acts. So somebody came to me and said, I, I understand if I incorporate, I can't, uh, I can't be liable uh, for, uh, around my invention. And the answer is wrong. You're always liable. If you design something that's defective, they can go after you. What you're really trying to do in the first instance here is if you have a group, a team together, you may in fact end up being a general partnership if you don't do something to form an entity. And in a general partnership, each of the partners, you don't need a written agreement. You just have to be you know, agreeing you're going to, through action or, or whatever, that you're going to be engaged in, the, in this project. Um, each of you is severally liable if there's a, a problem. And you're jointly liable. So that means if Yost and I are in a partnership and I do something that causes damage, they can go after both of us, even though he did nothing. So this is not a very good thing for an investor, right? Why would I invest in your company to find out that I'm, all of my assets could be at risk? Um, so typically, what you want to do is to think about what, what kind of organization uh, entity will limit the liability of the investors. And there are a lot of discussions, but for most of the companies you'll see around here, it'll be a corporation. And often, it'll be a Delaware corporation because of a whole bunch of things about Delaware law, especially if you're raise, going to raise a lot of money. Um, you should incorporate sooner rather than later to avoid the personal liability uh, for acts of others. Um, and minimize taxes. I'm going to talk about Section 83 here in a moment. Um, when you do have a corporate entity, you want to make sure you maintain it. If you don't, the courts may, may pierce the corporate veil, as they say. So you should be signing things in the corporate name. Joe Hedzima, you know, XYZ Corporation by Joe Hedzima, president. Not signing at Joe Hedzima. Um, the challenge of picking a company name, there's a good story behind Diva, but I don't have enough time to talk <laughs> about it. Um, suffice it to say, Diva was a desktop video editing company, came out of the Media Lab, the first spin up of the Media Lab, and it was acquired by a company called Avid. And if you spell Diva backwards, you get Avid. There's a nice story about it, all of that. Um, you probably, for most of the things, want to do uh, an S corporation. So a corporation is a tax, is a, it's an entity that, that can be, it's a person. Remember Romney saying corporations are people too? He was, act, he was accurate, it's, it's a legal person and can be taxed. <clears throat> so you often, um, if you don't do anything to make an S election, then any profit that the corporation has is going to be taxed at the corporation level. And then when it's, when it's passed out as dividends to shareholders, it's taxed again. And I'll show you some numbers. 
If you can get an S election, you should. Uh, it has to be fewer than 100 shareholders, one class of stock, and they all have to be uh, U.S. citizens or, or residents and can have um, uh, other kind of entities except for certain kinds of trusts. Um, so here's subchapter S. Um, if most of the startup companies are going to lose money at the beginning, then why do I care? What, there won't be any taxes. It's because of the exit. At the end of the day, if the company exits. So here's a comparison of C corporation, which is if you do nothing, an S corporation tax. Let's say the company assets are sold for, or profit is 100,000. If you're a C corporation, the net cash to the owners is uh, uh, about uh, 50%. If you're an S corporation, it's about, whatever is that, 53, 53%? It's 13% difference under the current tax rates. So the general strategy is to uh, incorporate uh, elect S status when the, if you take outside money from a venture fund, it'll destroy the S status. In the case of Diva, uh, because they chose S corporation, they ended up saving close to $2 million in taxes uh, just because of that one piece of paper. Uh, all right, this one, this is, a, this is a key one that's gonna get you into trouble. Section 83 of the Internal Revenue Code. Most of the time, we don't get taxed unless we get money, right? You go to work, you get a check, your paycheck, and they take the tax out of it. And you grumble, but at least you get taxed. The problem with 83 is you can be taxed when you don't get money. Here's how it works. If you receive uh, property in connection with providing services, then, and property in this case is stock, is property in a corporation. So if, you're, if you go to work for a company and they give you stock as part of your compensation, you have ordinary income equal to the fair market value of your property, of the property you got, minus what you paid. And um, so let's, so let's just say we, we decide we're going to set up a company. Um, I'm the investor. Yost is the entrepreneur. And um, let's say uh, we agree that I'm going to get 50% of the company and I'm, I'm going to give a million dollars in. And we're going to set the company up. Yost is going to get half the stock, I'm going to get half the stock. So the value of the stock Yost got is worth, might be worth half. He pays zero. He might have ordinary income of 500000 which could mean $200,000 of cash Wait, tax. Wait, 20 million for half is half is. You could do it the other way, too. You could say it's that. Uh, right, because why, why, if I paid, a million for half the company, wouldn't the other half of the company be worth a million? You might argue, well, the only assets in the company is the money. So I start with the simple case. So it could be he has to come up with $400,000 to pay the tax guy. Ugh. Oops. <laughs> All right. And now why did that happen? Um, you want to separate the time between when you get the, the stock and when there's a value event. If I wait until the time the investment is coming in to set the company up, I can't argue. Maybe I can argue that it was half a million instead of a million. But what happened between the time of the term sheet and the time we closed a week later? On the other hand, if Yost had set up the company and issued stock to people uh, six months ago, as he was starting to work his plan and everything, and then I come along and I say, OK, I'll invest. Uh, when, when he got, put his stock in, or he got his stock, you, know, you might say ideas are a dime a dozen. So what's his stock worth? Maybe a penny a share. But so the closer together, the, the bigger the problem. And the question is, why does stock not get issued in time? Well, there are a lot of reasons. They're too busy. But it's really, they don't, people don't sit down and figure it out. So this one is an interesting way to think of this when you think about equity allocation. Uh, vertical axis is relative importance and time. And if I have a, two founders, I have a technical founder and a business founder, and they get together. Where would you put the technical founder on this graph at time equals zero? You'd put it up there, right? Presumably, right? The product is being, the technology is being developed. And what about business? 
there's probably nothing for the business people to do other than to think about the business. Right? So the technology person is thinking, geez, I'm working all this time. It's my technology. I should get a lot of the company. And the business person is, you know, not really shown anything yet. So over time, what happens? What's the relative importance lines of these two things? Well, I would say over time, the relative importance of technology goes down and the relative importance of business goes up. Now, the slopes and everything, it doesn't matter. It's just in order to be successful, you need the technology and the business. So the problem is people, it's hard to have these discussions at the beginning about how we're going to allocate stock, and so it sort of rolls along, and then the next thing you know, gosh, there's the money for the investment, and we better set the company up, and then we finally make a decision, and we're into the 83 problem. So um, the other thing that's, that's bad about this is if the measuring time for that fair market value minus what you pay is when you get the stock, unless the stock is subject to vesting. And typically, stock is subject to vesting because we only want to, you earn it as you stay on and do what you said you were going to do. The problem there is if it's vesting, they measure it when the vesting kicks in. And so the value of the company keeps going up. So now you compound the problem. The, th the thing to do is get the stock out early and make what's called an 83B election, which has to be done in 30 days. And it says, I want to take the tax hit now. And then anything above that, it's just like I bought the stock. So we're almost, almost up against the thing, yes? So to clarify, founders should be asking their legal counsel yep. about this yep. earlier rather than later. Right. Earlier rather than later. Later on, what can happen is because how do, I, how do I incent you to come onto the company later on when I've got funding and everything? That's where options come in. And the next part is going to discuss options, basically options uh, don't get taxed the same way. But since I've run out of the whole time, I'm not going to be able to go through that tonight.